evening. I need to preface what I'm going to show you with a couple of comments. First of all, none of what I'm going to show you is a criticism of city staff or any of the people who have spoken before me. I do know Portsmouth very well. I've only lived here 10 years, but I studied it professionally before I moved here. And despite what the PS21 folks have said, I don't walk five miles around town every day. I usually walk eight to 10 miles. <laughs> so I know the downtown and its surrounding environments very, very well. You can't get to know a place any better than as a pedestrian. And it's heartening to me that even though there are improvements that could be made to Portsmouth, that we'll talk about a little bit, I have had experiences in Portsmouth streets that I don't have elsewhere in the world, including people saying hello to me across the street. <laughs> that is very rare. And it's not because I'm a particularly good looking guy or anything else. You know, it's just people being friendly. And that is engendered by the Portsmouth environment. So, you know, that's some of my initial opening comments. Um, I have two general broad categories to talk about tonight. One is what we can do with um, our streets, in the, mostly in the downtown. And then I'll talk a little bit about the one-way, two-way issue that I think might, people might find illuminating. So we're looking at the need for some more parking downtown. I have looked at this issue professionally and personally. After a seven-month wait, I have a space in the Hanover garage. <laughs> so if I can declare victory on that point. Uh, and I'm very happy to have that because doing the three-hour shuffle on State Street was not fun. But even without our extreme snow conditions of last winter, I know the downtown has a parking problem. And Michael, whose last name I forget, Manville, I did attend his lecture, which was very, very good, at um, Part 3 space about a month or so ago. I agree with almost everything he said, except he didn't touch on the ratio of parking to space in the downtown. Parking pricing is very important, and it was a very key part of his lecture. And it is a key component of how to manage the downtown parking. But I've studied it, and the parking ratio in downtown Portsmouth is very, very, very low and is sustainable primarily because the banks allow us to park in their parking lots and the vacant space. So if we want to have a more vibrant downtown, we do need more parking. I'm not going to touch the 600 space garage unless somebody asks me a question about it, which I'm happy to talk about. But we do have the issue that any new structured space will cost between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars. So I thought it would make sense to <laughs> take a look around town. Um, I'm not a parking god, like this guy seems to be, and I do use business meters that actually measure things as opposed to a compass. But walking around and paying attention, which I do usually in other cities, when I'm asked to come on a charrette, and folks know what a design charrette is, but basically mm -hmm. it's a group of uh, different professionals getting together to figure out how to make a place better. And I, you almost always can find things that can happen in a place that ne don't necessarily cost a lot of money, and that's what I'm about to show you here in our town. I did this graphic a couple of years ago when I was on the Mayor's Blue Urban Committee, and just suffice it to say that for most of the green dotted streets, there's extra space as opposed to the red dotted streets where it's pretty constrained. And even, you know, portions like Bow Street do have 
extra space that could be considered. And now I'd like to introduce you to the most valuable parking spot in Portsmouth. <laughs> this one, if you get that spot, find a flag right here. <laughs> Declare victory. And, you know, tell your neighbors by Twitter and email that you've got the best spot in town. Now it can be argued, you know, maybe in front of the bagel place, whatever, but um, <laughs> this is without question a very, very valuable spot. And when it comes to pricing, back to Michael's comments from a month ago, this should be a very valuable spot. It shouldn't cost the same to park here as it costs to park on State Street or across the park on Pleasant Street or you know other places in the downtown. This would be a really premium spot. So let's look at where it exists. Unfortunately, Google's aerials aren't that great, so I'm going to use a few of these tonight, but you hopefully you can bear with me. Here we are. And we've got, and this is something that has made my teeth hurt since the first time I saw it. <laughs> Dual left turn lanes from Pleasant Street onto Congress Street. Um, there's only one word for that, it's absurd. <laughs> it's not necessary. It increases the pedestrian crossing distance. Um, it's just, it's nuts. You know, Market Square, Bob Thorson and I were on the Blue Ribbon Committee and Bob was on, he was the planning director in the 70s when the last time the Market Square area was redone. He and I agree, it needs to be redone. You know, it, it's good, but it can be better. And we, we can make this place better, and we should make it better. So here we are with this silly dual left turn lane. Well, guess what? <laughs> If we take away one of those left turn lanes, we just doubled the on-street parking in the most valuable part of Portsmouth. So it can go from this to this. Wow. And not affect anybody in any way. Now, let's look at Post Street. Would anybody think that there might be some extra space <laughs> with this car, like, not even knowing what it's like? <laughs> I've measured it, and, you know, this is the way it looks, again, in Google, for cars to go two ways in between, without question. Then there's the now. Near Bowstreet. And again, what I've come to feel is that Portsmouth, I don't know when, I'm going to guess in the 70s, was the victim of traffic engineering. Downtown should be very pedestrian friendly. Now, I am a photographer as well as an engineer, so I did try to make this look cool. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would guess this is downtown Portsmouth? If you didn't know, this is where they're at. I mean, Maple, yeah. Maplewood. Maplewood. Maplewood, I'm sorry. Maplewood. And there's Port Um When I was going through my slides getting ready for tonight, because I have so many from different parts of the world, I was like, where is this? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, these, the shrubbery, mm -hmm. uh, the sidewalk that's from hell. Mm -hmm. um, lots can happen here. So, just quickly, here, I've looked at the numbers, and I've done this. I've done this in Peoria, I've done this in St. Louis, I've done this in other locations. This is a road diet waiting to happen. It's an over -anchor. We can make this road into three lanes with on-street parking adjacent to the city core all along here. 
and it will work. We can study it, we can spend lots of money, I've done it in other locations, it will work. So this alone can make another 25 to 30 on-street spaces adjacent to the downtown. And even more, if we look at in decreasing the throat lengths of these driveways for the um, worth lot, the worth lot's a whole separate chapter. <laughs> and even little things. Here's a little piece of Hanover Street that has these two dedicated turn lines. I guarantee you, without knowing the actual numbers, but I guarantee you from watching it, there is no justification for these two dedicated turn lines. I'm not asking for Eric, the other that I know traffic engineer in the room to verify this, because he doesn't know either, but I'll bet you that this would be a better solution to put on-street parking and grab three or four more spaces with meters and, you know, additionally traffic calm this little tiny piece of Hanover Street west of um, Maplewood. Now, here's Fleet Street. This is interesting, and just back <laughs> notice this. So here we've got, we've got the bank parking um, drive up over here, and it seems like a pretty wide street. So I measured it and compared it to this one, which is right nearby. This is Court Place, the other side of the TD Bank parking lot. <coughs> this street. Now, on street parallel parking is 70 feet wide. So here we have this street, here we have this street. How much wider do you guess this street is than the other one? I'll tell you, six feet. So we can go from this to this and pick up another four or five spaces and just move the the center. I didn't I didn't move this car. <laughs> so you can see it's uh, you know with the revised striping a little bit out of place. We took it from beside the church to now here's another little small thing that again now that I've shown you the low-hanging fruit, I'm sure everybody can guess what's coming next, but um, here we have a turn lane on State Street coming onto Pleasant Street. Ideally, it would be a wider <coughs> sidewalk that, you know, perhaps the wine bar could use or pedestrians could use because it's a pretty narrow sidewalk on this thing. You know, that's, I use that and it's, it's not comfortable if you're meeting other pedestrians going the other direction. But if we can't do that, then you know maybe just move all of these cars that we're moving into a parking position adjacent to that street. It's only a few spaces, but again, we're talking downtown parking spaces, and they're rather valuable. <laughs> this one is another no-brainer. <laughs> uh, I tell people as I travel when you see this stuff, the diagonal striping. It means, I don't know what to do. <laughs> As you can see, the curb line is straight. The yellow center line is straight. So this on-street parking should continue in front of River Run Bookstore for several more spaces. Now, I would also prefer to see the sidewalk widened. Yeah. But that's, again, more money. So tomorrow, we could have more on-street parking. In a year, we could have a wider sidewalk and a much friendlier experience getting to the River Run Bookstore, which is a great spot. So now we have the mystery of the on street. So as we come in from Maine, 
we have on street parallel parking and a, you know it's 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 more of a one car lane but then holy mackerel you know we've got the space between um, and hello and back to <laughs> chapel that is very wide and I've measured it. You can fit three cars between here and here. And then you get a little bit further north, no question, it's a one lane street as we approach uh, Market Square. So this space, it's not big, but it's, it's significant. <coughs> On this side, if we convert this to um, diagonal parking, we can get 12 more spaces. Can you hold the microphone out a little? I'm sorry. If we if we get if we convert this side of the street to diagonal parking, we can get 12 more spaces. Now, outside the downtown, there are other opportunities. Parrot Avenue is gigantic but it varies a lot in cross-section. When the middle school renovations came up, it was raised in the herald the concern of who manages, who owns the parking, who can control the parking on Parrot Avenue. I'm a licensed land surveyor, I will tell you the city can. The city owns all of this land and all of this land, and by virtue of that, all of this land. There's a, what's called a viatic easement for the public to be able to travel through here. But in terms of parking, the city can do whatever it wants. Lots of opportunity to create additional parking on Parrot Avenue. And again, if you convert this to diagonal, it's, it's an instant double. Very simple, very simple math. Down by Sanders, uh, I know it's a state highway. I realize, you know, it's um, it is what it is. But this width allows a lot more parking. And I, I know from being a patron of Sanders and um, the Jason Shop. <laughs> just for bread. That's right. And crackers. Um, these spaces are usually fully occupied, despite this photo. And we could easily get um, double the parking on the side of the street, and perhaps you know close to that on the side of the street as well. So it's something to look at and think about, and consider in the areas outside the downtown as well. So here is a, an unfair, perhaps, video that I shot a few, about a month ago, when obviously there was snow on the ground. And you'll notice the drivers yielding to me, attempting to cross the, <laughs> the street. Now, in their uh, defense, I was unable to get to the actual end of the crosswalk because the snow hadn't been cleared. So I went back yesterday. To clear it up. <laughs> and notice that the bridge, the bridge was actually up. <laughs> so there's no reason for this. <laughs> And in their defense, this driver, under current New Hampshire law, did not violate the law. You have to be in this side of the street. This driver would have to be in this side of the street to legally be required to yield to me. And in both these videos, both this one and the one prior, I was holding the camera at waist level. I was not an obvious cameraman. So, you know, these people were just not paying attention. And I have to tell you, in walking around lots and lots and lots of the downtown, the others I've mentioned, I have had 
four instances in the last five years of uniformed people in official vehicles giving me a very friendly hello as they drove past and didn't give it to me. <laughs> so, I don't know if this is part of our <coughs> next solution for pedestrian friendly downtown courses, but here's, this was earlier today, this is what Peter Rice will be doing soon because of the um, horrible winter we had and restriping things, but I think we need to do more. I think we need to do every pedestrian desire line in the downtown needs a crosswalk. And, I hate to say it, I think we need these kinds of things that I put out of scale on purpose to let drivers know because even though those drivers down by the bridge were not required to stop for me, in very pedestrian friendly areas they do, even if they're on the opposite lane. That's what we need to encourage in the downtown. And I would like to see that because it would enhance all of our downtown experience, all of the downtown um, pedestrian activity and bicycles as well. So now the little bit more controversial topic of one way versus two way. I did the required Google search <laughs> and found almost 67 million uh, hits in 0.31 seconds. <laughs> And when I started doing this stuff about 15 years ago, there was nothing. You know, I was a pretty lone voice in the wilderness. It's pretty well established today that two-way streets are much, much, much better for your downtown. And for multiple reasons, I'll talk about a few of them in a minute, but... Um, Circulation is much easier. Visitors from out of town don't have to circulate around and around to try to figure out where the heck they're going. And um, a few other details I'll point out. But when I first came across this, I actually, because I'm a geek, I went to Washington on my own dime and did some research and found Interesting things like um, stuff that we forget. This is unphotoshopped. Didn't touch it. This is out of, out of this book. CM was a predecessor to the current Congress of New Urbanism. I don't know if folks in the room have ever heard of it, but um, its most recent Congress is happening later this week in Dallas. These guys were much more cool, though, because they had their Congresses on yachts and in castles. <laughs> But they were misguided. They were very, very heavily impacted by the recent war and the ongoing war. And they said that, for example, this type of planning, which is from New York, was very good because one bomb can really take out one or two houses. This type of planning, which is Central Europe, was very bad because one bomb could take out so much. And that really unfortunate thought is embedded in a lot of our current planning regulations. And I would submit, even despite the NSA and its focus on terrorism being such a real and present threat, that this is not a real and present threat, and we shouldn't design our neighborhoods based on this. The American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, or AASHTO, um, is the, I did to use the term, but I will, the deity of um, street design in America. And it's, this volume is called The Green Book, it's had a crisis of color in recent years. It really had a crisis of color a few years ago. 
And it originally had an extremely crisis of color when it was first published in 1940. But the point here with these quick images is that Ashto's, and it was Ash-O, um, and at this point, because it was American Associated State Highway Officials without transportation in the name, they were focused on highways, which made sense. They were focused on highways at a time when Germany had created the Autobahn. Adolf Hitler had promoted it as a superior form of thoroughfare, and it was for the purposes engendered. And the American transportation group felt that it was necessary to come up with something in opposition to the Germans, and so we came up with our interstates and all of the other things that we've done to uh, both cities and in between cities. So here's an example of how a transportation policy, a series of transportation policies, could impact a place. This is Peoria, Illinois. This is Peoria, downtown, believe it or not. That's also downtown. So I was asked, because I was part of a team working on the downtown enhancement a few years ago, why do we have streets like this? I mean, that, that doesn't seem like a street. It seems like a highway. I'm like, yeah, no, you're right. It's a highway. And even that is more of a highway than a street. As it turns out, doing the research, it's because of public policies. And what took this from a two-way street with public transit, on-street parking, and gazillions of these things, you know, I guess they're called pedestrians. Uh, <laughs> you won't believe this. This is three years ago. Same spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One-way street, no transit, does still have on-street parking, not much used. And, you know, there are, there are a couple of pedestrians out there, but, you know, in comparison? <laughs> so it was not just two-way to one-way conversion. It was not just functional classification that is a very serious issue for me. And I was at the last design charrette that I couldn't attend here in town. I was at the University of Kentucky speaking about that issue specifically for U.S. cities. Um, the fact that this became designated a principal arterial made it more likely to become a one-way street, more likely to not have transit, more likely to be higher speeds, 35 to 40 miles an hour, in fact. And, you know, we went from this to this. Now, it was more than just those policies that made that change, but those policies had huge impacts and very measurable impacts that you can see side by side. I mean, even the details of the buildings got diminished. I mean, it's, it's just it's amazing. So the other thing about one-way streets that's damaging to a downtown, here's Ladd Street at uh, Market. What seems wrong with that? You know. Nice small street. Market's a nice street. Market's a beautiful street. Market's one of the best streets in New Hampshire, if not New England. The problem with this is drivers who know where they are. Last week, and I didn't get an image of this, I'm sorry, but I'm telling the truth. A young lady was crossing from here over to here. And she literally was pushed by a car coming out from Ladd Street because the driver was only looking left. He knew where he was. 
and knew he only needed to look to the left in order to see oncoming pedestrians. And that is a very serious issue. I, I experience on State Street on a daily basis. It's really an issue with drivers who know what they're doing, or where they are, rather. Um, and luckily, the driver came out slowly. So she literally just pushed herself on the hood and you know, mm. came back. If it had been a more aggressive, younger driver, everyone only knows what might have happened. That's a real issue with one-way streets. This is another real issue with one-way streets. Here we have Pleasant and State Street. And all day long, this happens. Because there's no opposing traffic, every, not every, most of the drivers who turn right from Pleasant onto State swing wide. And they swing wide and swing fast. So instead of staying in this lane, they swing wide and go into this lane, which is also the lane headed to the bridge. So it makes sense in their minds to swing left, stay in that lane, head toward the bridge. And earlier today, I took my radar unit out, and this is complete. It's real, but it's only anecdotal. I measured speeds here, and then I measured speeds um, below Penn Hallett, and then I measured speeds right to the bridge. In this area, speeds were around 20 miles an hour. Pretty good. Uh, below Penn Hallow, they were more like 25. And as we approached the bridge, they increased to where I had one driver at 37, which is the lethal threshold. If you're struck by a car going 37 miles an hour faster, you're most likely to be killed. So it's an issue. So, <clears throat> you know, here we are on Pleasant Street. And guess what? You could go back to what it was. It was two-way. Like all American cities were two-way at one point. There was no point of one-way streets. One-way streets, in summary, were <clears throat> unfortunately designed for a time when American cities were not liked. American cities were places to get into and out of as quickly as possible. They were places where white flight was happening as a very real event. And the idea of evacuation, as I mentioned with the bomb slab, was a very real event. And so you can evacuate a city with one-way streets much faster than you can a city with two-way streets. So it's, it's a concept that has validity if you take certain prior assumptions as valid. I don't. Not anymore. <coughs> so that's what State Street very quickly could look like it's two-way. It's completely wide enough. And this relates to the one-way, two-way thing. Um, I've already seen this year, the last two weeks, State Street functions primarily as one way toward Maine. And when the bridge comes up, it's a parking lot. It's a parking lot back beyond Puzzle Street. And I, this may require some negotiation with the Coast Guard, because if this guy's coming through the bridge, the bridge needs to come up. I understand that. But I know at least for much of the recent past, it's come up on a regular basis whether it needs to or not. <clears throat> That's illogical to me. And I think it might require negotiation with the Coast Guard, as I mentioned. Because every time this guy comes up, it's a it's gridlock back you know, for quite some many blocks. And State Street going to two-way wouldn't change that a lot because again, it's primarily one approach uh, one, one approach line. So here's Lowell Mass, 
when I worked with Eric, our new traffic engineer, um, I think maybe two years ago. And we looked at the idea of uh, converting the downtown, which is a little bit more intense than downtown Portsmouth, into a two-way flow. And we have tools. This one happens to be synchronous in traffic, where I can look at the um, actual flows, the actual traffic time, signal timings, the actual stop signs, the yield signs, and all that, and predict what might be happening for traffic flows. And this is not real. These numbers are not real. I don't have the real numbers of Portsmouth, but this is how Portsmouth could possibly work as a two-way system in the downtown. And they're not real, but they're based on approximations from Google traffic numbers. And as you can see, you know, a two-way Congress Street, two-way State Street could possibly work. And I'm looking forward to more exploration and more work with the city and more work with other folks. And thank you very much.